Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you are listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm chatting with Margaret Jones. Margaret is the head of content at Airtable, previously the director of brand communications at Envoy and the global brand strategist at Eventbrite. In this conversation, we go deep on content operations at Airtable with a long pit stop on documentation to define what good quality content actually means. Reducing subjectivity is important at this step, and Margaret outlines detailed steps to make this incredibly clear. We also talked about her contrarian views on why content marketing, as many of us know it, is dead and quite cheesy, actually, and why the friendly neighborhood content marketer who's just giving you value and not selling you anything, I promise, needs to transform in this modern era. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Margaret Jones. So um, I have a little pit bull. He'll probably make an appearance at some point during this time. She's she's with the dog walker right now. Um, but she's just been like, she's my favorite child. Like she's so incredible and like has really, um, it's really changed my life to like take her on walks every day. Um, and just like, I don't know, having having a little animal in the house is so great. And I've been thinking about how like, when I'm old and like by myself, I will have like three or seven dogs mm, and just dogs like, li- like live, just like live in the woods with dogs. And that will be my <laughs> new, like that feels like the best way to like be an old person. But I'm also like very concerned that that's not possible because like retirement doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I think we should keep this in and just start the, the podcast from this point. So okay, you, you did say uh, <laughs> that it's your favorite child. And isn't that going to be yeah. offensive to your, your child child once <laughs> they inevitably listen to this podcast in the future? Uh, yeah. The, archives I mean, Ta- of, uh, the historical archives of the Omniscient podcast. Yeah. I mean, Tycho, my beautiful son, he's three years old. Um, and like, you know, buddy, if you're hearing this, like, she potty trained so much faster than you. Um, like girls are always a little bit smarter. Um, and like, you know, she like sleeps at night. She slept through the night at like, you know, 15 weeks old. And like, he still doesn't. So it's, it's hard to compete with that. It's not even a competition. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Um, we'll, we'll start on some actual content topics, but I, we got connected because Ronnie Higgins, um, recommended you actually twice. Uh, he recommended again when I asked him in the Twitter DMS, but I looked back, uh, about a year ago, I asked for recommendations and I forgot to reach out to you at that point, I think. So apologies that we're just now conversing, but, this um, is great. This is great. You worked with Ronnie at Eventbrite. Yeah. 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 Um, Ronnie was, um, such a great hire. Um, we, and he had like written, he sent us some like beautiful samples, um, about his like time in new Orleans. Um, I remember they were like about hurricane Katrina, um, and just like kind of unconventional samples, which like the thing about hiring writers, especially at the time Ronnie was more junior now he's very senior, but like, this was one of his, like, I think this was his second, like true content job. Um, it's like, I don't know, you can teach people the tech stuff. You can teach people the marketing stuff. You can teach people how to use Salesforce. Like none of that is rocket science, but like being a good writer and like loving to write, you kind of, you can't really teach that. That has to be, um, it can be taught, but I think it has to be self-taught. So I just remember like reading like Ronnie's samples and being like, oh, this person is a writer. Mm. Um, and like. I do think, and Ronnie and I talked about this a lot, actually, um, you can improve yourself as a writer. Um, I have an MFA in writing, so like I should feel that way, but like it's not through um it's not through like putting your nose to the grindstone. I actually think like people become better writers through reading more and through like reading more widely. Um <laughs> I actually remember Ronnie will like this story. Um, but at some point. He um he was writing for our like kind of more corporate event audience at Eventbrite. So like 
a lot of our clients were like a music promoter <laughs> or like a person who does like a Lego conference. You know, like people were like not your classic um, like enterprise B two B buyers. Um, and he was writing for like what was more of that like traditional buyer. So someone who like hosts like a big corporate conference or something like that. And he was really struggling to like get the voice. Like he was like, how do I write for these people? Like, um, and he happened to be reading, I think it was Death by Meeting, one of those like Patrick, um, what's that guy's name? Patrick Leon. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he writes like all he writes like a ton of business books. So like mm -hmm. Ronnie was reading business books. And um <laughs> at some point I was like, what if you like read that? And then like immediately tried to write afterward because like these business books are kind of written for your same audience that you're trying to write for. Mm -hmm. Um, and you and he'd been really liking them. So I was like, what if we like, you know, when you read something, you just kind of like get that um syntax like mm -hmm. stuck in your head. Yeah, the voice becomes like if, almost your voice for yeah, a second. You start writing like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the plague of like any grad students be like, now I think I'm Joan Didion. Like, rah, 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 rah. um, <laughs> but so like he um he tried that and it worked really well. <laughs> I remember him like coming to me like a few days later and being like, that's just like unlocked, you know, like reading, reading these business books and th that I liked that are like engaging written and then immediately going in and trying to write for that audience um, for our content marketing. It's working really well. Um, so yeah, something, one of many things I love about Ronnie is like, he's always kind of down to like try something um, and like so humble about just like, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I want to improve. Like, what should I try? Like, what could work here? Yeah, I, I've Sorry, always you found... like didn't. Uh... No, no, that was great. I was actually going to ask what you learned from from Ronnie. Um, so that that's a good. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I was wondering. But um, yeah. you noted that there's sort of underlying uh, maybe character traits of of good writers, and those are hard to train. Yeah. And I've always thought, yeah. like, the, you, you know, you could read on writing by Stephen King or something like that. And there's like certain sure. tactical Great surface one. level stuff that you can do. But like, for me, it was always, it's hard to train curiosity and it's hard to train taste. Taste is especially mm. important for editors, but curiosity is something that like, I feel like it's hard to invoke in somebody that doesn't already have that. Oh, that's so interesting. Like, I never really think about taste and like writing skill together, but I can, I can see how you draw that parallel. Like, um, cause well, the thing about taste, I, okay, well, it's hard to know what's good bad. and what's bad. Like, how do you explain yeah, good yeah, and bad yeah. content? Like there's but a certain like, genetic flaw <laughs> to it. Sure. Sure. But like, I think taste is a lot more subjective than like writing mechanics. Um, like for sure when it comes to writing, um, there are authors who I love, who people who I love and respect think are terrible. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like they're like, I find that person unreadable and I'm like, Oh no, that's like the best writing there is. There is a subjectivity to it. But I think when it comes to, especially when we're talking about, um, academic writing or marketing writing, um, writing that like has a very concrete purpose and is less kind of about like the mood. Um, I think you can be a little bit more, um, objective about saying like, this is strong and this is less strong. Um, mm. it's never a hundred percent, but I think you can actually generally come to some consensus about like whether a piece is working or not versus like something like taste, you and I could have really different taste, right? Like really, really, really different taste. Like you could come into my home and just be like, what are you doing here? This looks terrible. <laughs> like I would never put this color here. I would never choose that coffee table. Um, these plates have nothing to do with this silver. What are you doing here? And I could be like, oh no, that's exactly what I love about it. And we would both be right, you know? Mm. Um, like I kind of, I don't know if I really believe in like bad taste. Like, I don't know if I really think bad taste exists. I think it's just like different taste, but I do think there's bad writing. And what is bad writing? Bad writing. Well, I mean, ask my friend Chat GTP um, is writing a lot of really bad stuff. <laughs> and like, and like, not to say that, I, like, I, sorry um, to interrupt. I actually think yeah, so. Yeah. Maybe we're doing a definitional thing here, but I think Chat GPT yeah. has fine writing. Like the the structure of the writing is fine. I think it's bad. Like the mechanics, substance. Yeah. And that's where I think taste comes into yeah, play. Maybe is that's... being able to say that's not good and. I can't tell you why there's something that's missing. There's something that's not but there. I think you can. I don't think Steve, but when you said je ne sais quoi, I was like, no, like say quoi. Like you can say what's not there. Right. <laughs> like 
when I see a piece from like, and I see something, if I ask ChatGTP to write something for me, which I do all the time, I'm like, hey, here's the outline. Can you write the introduction and the conclusion? My least favorite parts. Can you write those parts for me? I can look at it and say, oh, wow, they use like the same word like three different times in this paragraph. That like feels... That's like repetitive. I can look at it and say, um, there's like a bunch of extra stuff in here that's just like not doing anything. And I mean that very literally, like you're not advancing anything forward with these two sentences. So like, that's bad. Let's cut those out. Um, Mm -hmm. Or like, um, (laughs) sometimes I'll ask ChatGDP, I'm sure you've had this experience of saying like, can you make this funny? And or like can or like can you make this more bold or like like you kind of ask them to like put a little more voice on it and it's so um, it's so expected because it's just it's just like pulling algorithmically from like the way other writing has done that like I mean it's it's using like this huge data set right to say um, what are like when I look at all the words on the internet. Um, what do like the bold ones sound like? And they'll say things like in your face, you know, <laughs> like they're like they're using these phrases that are like no, no like actual person um is like proud of themselves for like using that, right? Because it's so cliche, it's so trite and so unoriginal. But that's what chat GTP specializes in is unoriginality. Because they are very like mathematically what they are doing is copying, like, predicting and copying. So like they can't come up with anything new. That's like the whole problem. And that's where we have to like bring the humans in to like come up with something new. Um, but I think back to our like, you know, is it subjective? Is it objective? I think I can objectively say if I've read this same sentence before, it's not good for what I'm trying to do here. Right. But something that's generic and less funny to me, that feels like judgment or taste. That feels like something where it's like if you were playing by like a rule book, if it was like if this, then that, it's like pull this statement because it's like hyperbolic and pull this one because it's like, I you think know, like ironic or something like that. But you're like, it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah. It just feels like you're you're pulling this from like a see, playbook of sorts. Right, right, right. But see, that's actually that's actually very specific to say this feels like it's coming from a playbook. What you mean by that is I've read it before. What you mean by that. General is like a real word. General has a definition. What general means is like, this has been used in other, like a broad range of other circumstances. And because it's been used in all these circumstances, it does not feel specific to what we're talking about here. Right? Like that's what you mean when you say it's general. So like, that's actually, again, objective. Like you're, and I think like as an editor, right? Or a person who reviews things, frequently when I read it, I'm just like, Oh, this seems bad to me, (laughs) right? Like my first reaction is like, oh, I don't like this. This feels off. This isn't working. But when I dig in, I should be able to say, here's why. And like, I actually think, especially if you're working with writers who you want to grow as writers, Mm -hmm. it's really important that you don't just leave it at like, this isn't working. This is bad. This is bad. (laughs) Like, I mean, I'm sure you've had that experience of someone like just like commenting on you, like, this is bad. (laughs) Like, why? You know, (laughs) and like, and like I think it's the editor's job to like challenge themselves to actually like deliver an objective, reasonable reason that it's bad. So this is one of the Versus, more structured approaches to editing that I've heard. I mean, this is my this is my jam. Like, um, because I want to teach my writers and because I also like I want to challenge myself that I'm not just like having a, a taste reaction, right? Because right. like my, you know. My taste at some point, like I am going to have to like defer to my taste, right? There's maybe going to be two different ways that both feel good, and we're going to have to pick one, and that's where my taste is going to come in. But I can't use my taste to just say like do it different, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's not good editing. Yeah. Do you have a model for how you how you edit, or like (laughs) like it sounds like you start Um, at a high level, maybe with taste, but then you like yeah specific things you're looking for. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I and mean, there's a lot of specific things I'm looking for. Um, and it's funny, I was just talking to a writer on my team about this this morning, because we're always talking about this. But um, uh, when it comes to model, like, I have been asked to quantify, you know, like, what are the things that I think make writing good? And that's always like a fun conversation. Like you get into like, yeah, things like sentence mechanics, or like, um, uh, you know, if I look at this paragraph, and I say, um, all the sentences are the same length, right? Like, as a reader, I know rhythmically, like, 
that's going to be boring. It's not going to keep my attention. Yeah. Yeah, Like, and like that stuff you can get in like Howard Zinn, that stuff you can get from Stephen King. Like we all know there, there are rules to writing well. And those rules, like they still pretty much work today. Yeah. Um, so like that's one piece of it, but, um, in terms of like the way I edit, I think my, (laughs) my number one model has been like all the like, like shitty editing that I've done like all of the like bad feedback I've given and like feelings that I've hurt and like work that hasn't been as good as it could have been because I didn't take the time to like do a better job. Um, like <laughs> I, when I was in college, I, um, I got like, a, I think it was a paid job um, editing the school paper. Um, Cause like, you know, like within a college, sometimes like those are like little paid positions. And um I remember the editor, like the the managing editor, gave me the proof and was like, "Can you copy edit?" And I was like, you know, like cracked my knuckles. <laughs> I was like, "Okay, this is gonna be so awesome for me." And I just like tore it apart. You know, like every single thing in there, I was just like switching it all up. And like, also, this was like I had just learned how to do like hand markings. Um, this is before like everyone used track changes or used like Google Docs for everything. So I was like literally like marking with a red pen. Mm -hmm. to death this like issue of like the student newspaper this is like when you say hand marking sorry this is like there are specific symbols like there's like three underlines under uh, under a letter and stuff like that and yeah 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 a lot of times you see editors have like a stat tattoo because stat just means like um i made a mark that was like wrong (laughs) so it's like i've like stat means i introduced an error Uh so if i'm like if i'm in the proof and i'm like make my little carrot and I like add my little comma and then I look at it and I'm like, Oh, actually no on that comma. I would put step right next to it to show like ignore because you don't Mm. just cross stuff out when you're, when you're hand marking. Um, so step is like very meaningful for a lot of people, but, um, yes. So I was doing like hand markings. So obnoxious. And I brought it back to this guy and I was like, look, I've like copied of your paper. And he was like, what did you do? You know, like, like what I'm going to sit down and like enter all these like notes in and like, you've totally taken these people's voices out. And like, now it just all kind of feels like the way you would have written it, which is not what Mm. we need to be the copy editor to look for mistakes. You know, like I just like went, it was such a good moment for me um, to just like a humbling moment of like, a like do the kind of editing you're asked to do, (laughs) not the kind of editing that like you want to do. And B like you can't, um, it's not, you're not trying to make it yours. Like that's not the job of the editor. The job of the editor is to like make it the best it can be and to like retain the original voice of the person writing. Um, And like later when I was in publishing, like a lot of what I did was um, leaving notes on manuscripts. So like fiction manuscripts (laughs) and like working with stuff like that. It's just, it's even more delicate where you're just like, okay, I want to um, give this person an opportunity to like, see this through their reader's eyes, right? And like catch things and like, let's collaborate in that way. But I'm not here to like rewrite this for you. I'm not here to like co-write this with you. Um, so yeah, and I, and I, you know, I, I still um, in my working life occasionally will notice myself trying to rewrite, you know, like, like finding like, maybe it would just be easier for me to like just redo this whole thing. Um, and the result of that is like, A, I've taught my writer nothing. Right. Um, Cause like they're not going to go like read the thing I wrote and like really meditate on like each new sentence I brought. They're just going to swap them out. Right. Yeah. You've they're taught them that you're going to write it for, for them. Yeah. Exactly. You've taught exactly. them kind of helplessness. Yeah. And probably not as good as it, as it would have been if I had just like explained to them what wasn't working, taking mm. the time to, to talk about what's not working and then let them figure it out. That would probably be better than what me just like in the Google doc late at night was going to come up with anyway. So I've done a disservice like to the piece as well as to the writer. How do you balance that out when you're writing for a brand and and presumably in a brand voice though? Like if I'm writing for Airtable, I'm not necessarily going to have probably the brand voice and the style that is, you know, set from the top at Airtable. Like how do you balance my voice with Airtable's voice? Yeah. I mean, a lot of that happens up front. So like at first I was going to say, you know, if the question is just like getting something to feel on brand, like if you have your brand guidelines, this should be easier than if you didn't, right? Like if you have a strong brand voice, 
and you've got your characteristics. We're, we're like doing a rev on this right now at Airtable. So it's very much on my mind, but I should be able to look at things and say, okay, one of our brand characteristics is uh, welcoming. Thought like a lot of tech brands have that as a, as a characteristic. Um, I should be able to say like this sentence, which where you like kind of uh, set up this product to seem like very exclusive is not like flexing into our welcoming brand characteristics. So like that should actually make it easier for me to justify wealth, why it hmm. felt off to me. Right. Um, but this question of like, kind of like individual personalities or like individual brands within brands, I think it's really interesting. Like some, some of my favorite brands, I was just, uh, um, do you read content from Doug Kessler? He's like an OG. I, I um, have, yeah. 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 Like he writes at Velocity Partners, which I think he founded. And like he has a really strong editorial voice. Um, and like his, when he sends out an email, um, it's very particular to him. I find it super engaging because it's like talking to a very interesting person, um, which lots of tech brands do not sound that way. And a lot of agencies don't sound that way, but they really do. Um, and I would argue like a lot of the brand identity of Velocity Partners sounds a lot like Doug <laughs> and that's fine. Um, but like if you can carve out space for those individual voices and like make them um, like fit into your overall brand voice versus like trying to kind of force every person at your company to write the same way, it's actually kind of a shortcut to that feeling of like, closeness and familiarity that you want to create with your audience. If they, it's, it's just inherently easier <laughs> to um, like bond with or like relate with like a person than a brand. Um, so like if it's done well, it, it, it goes really well, but I do think it's challenging for editors um, to like sort between, um, okay, does this, you're basically asking, does this individual's personality fit into our brand voice? Right? Yeah. It, it feels like to me that the modern approach is to sort of unleash those individual voices while maintaining the structure or the ethos of the publication. And yeah. your background is in journalism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Journalism, publishing, um, all the word stuff. Yeah. So I, I use yeah. the example of like the Atlantic. I know mm -hmm. the Atlantic as a structure, but like if I read a column from Arthur C. Brooks versus Derek Thompson, like they both have yeah. very strong voices. And I actually follow like Derek Thompson for his writing because of that. Right. And I feel like yeah, that, yeah. that to me feels like the, the smart and modern approach to like, if you're running a SAS blog, it, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends on, it depends on what you're doing there, right? Like if your SAS blog is very editorial, what you're trying to do is like bring in a variety of perspectives. Like if you're the Atlantic, <laughs> right? Like you are, you are selling your digital subscriptions because you have strong voices. Um, mm -hmm. And because you have people who like, um, like the folks you just mentioned, who like you specifically are looking for work by them, and you're probably like more willing to pay for that subscription because you know the Atlantic is going to like continually serve you up words from those people. Um, so like, yeah, that's definitely one approach. Um, but like, I'll give you another example. Let's say your <laughs> the goal of your blog is to um, explain how to use your product. Um, maybe you have a product like Airtable that like there's lots of explaining to do. Um, maybe having some of those individual voices um, isn't always what you're looking for, right? Like you're maybe looking to, um, to like strike a more educational tone. Um, so yeah, I think it just like depends depends what you're trying to do. Totally, y'all balance uh, UGC content like it's more so in templates, right? Like you guys have the um, the Airtable universe, is it? Yep, we have universe. Um, we just relaunched our community, um, which is like. Such a wonderful place. Um, if you like Airtable at all, I definitely recommend checking that out because um, it's where all our really smart people are like sharing sharing their tips and tricks and like troubleshooting together. Um, you know, part of like the challenge of Airtable is it's so uh, you know as we say like extensible. There's Unlimited like so cases, many basically. yeah. There's so many yeah. there's so many things you can do with Airtable and like we don't like we don't. At Airtable, we don't know what all of those things would be. Um, it would be they're like infinite. It is impossible. So like we really look to our community to tell us like, oh, we figured out a new thing to do, or we ran into a new challenge when we figured out this new thing to do. 
Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk more about that split and how you like, because I think there's a lot of customer centric content in, in different publications and different like campaigns and initiatives y'all do, but I wanted to start yeah. first. Well, how do I frame this? Uh, Ronnie had a question um, that I, I should ask you, but first let me couch this in the high level. So okay. head of content at Airtable, what is your vision content strategy? Like how do you describe the content focus at Airtable? Oh, it's so, I mean, it's so much. Um, <laughs> we're trying to do like, and like content is so much. Um, my team is really focused on like three extremely interconnected, um, like pieces of the pie. So like, um, uh, one is like kind of closer to like more traditional content marketing. So that's like, um, gated content we're working on, you know, we've got eBooks and reports and webinars. Um, they're generally, um, you know, they're behind gates. So we're driving pipeline with them. Um, and we're also like nurturing leads with them. And that's like very, very closely tied to, um, one part of our sales team, right? Like the folks who are like working new leads or trying to expand in like existing accounts. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're going to find like thought leadership. That's where you're going to find like, um, best practices that are kind of going to like take you deeper in your Airtable journey. Um, We've then got like a more editorial arm that's thinking like, okay, like what are um, what are the things that people are just like looking to know in our universe, you know? So like, without really talking about Airtable at all, what are like the best practices that people need to learn? That's also where we would bring in like, you know, if we've got external um, voices that we want to feature or internal mm -hmm. voices actually, um, and that's like the blog or like our more like SEO focused content. And then the third arm, which was new to me when I joined Airtable, is educational content. So that's the like, okay, let me actually take you into product, but let me frame it. This isn't like support content. This is like, let me tell you about a thing you can do and let me actually show you how to do it with the goal of like inspiring you and like getting you to like go in there and like play around maybe. Um, or it could be, you know, as we're moving into a world where like more and more of our product is like, accessible through interfaces. So like you don't have to be like building to be really in your table. You can actually just like go to the piece that you need, <laughs> um, which works a lot better for like larger teams where you're like, no, I literally need like, you know, thousands of people to be like in Airtable every day. So it's like not all of them need to like reconfigure the base. We just need them to like come through the interface. Um, so like now we have content that's like how to get your team on board, right? Or like um, what are the kinds of things you should be looking to do in Airtable, even if you're not a builder? Does SEO sit on the content team or is that a separate part of the organization or how does SEO interplay with content? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like many things at Airtable, like we're so connected in the way we work. Um, and so like they're a separate, they're they're separate on the org chart, but like we're we're together. We're together every day. Um, because I mean, with SEO, as you know, like what's what's the what's like the tool to make seo work it's content right um so like we the content team is there for both like let's gut check like let's look like before we go after certain terms um or like deploy a certain strategy does this actually feel relevant to our audience do we have the library of content to support it um like is it right for this like very specific segment who we're targeting here so like my team will come in to ask questions like that kind of beyond, hey, is there volume here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is often like where we start with SEO. Um, like, is there volume? Is there opportunity? Like, could we win here? And then my team kind of comes in to say like, yeah, but like, does it make sense for us to write about this? Um, and then we're also the ones frequently who are writing about those topics. Um, and, uh, and if we don't write it, we're probably reviewing and editing. So like super, super close partnership. So does the ideation part start with SEO and then move into content um, as more of a, an execution arm? Or does it start with content and SEO as like a supporting function to build out the briefs and the prioritization or? Yeah, it's gone in both directions. So like, you know, if we have, I'll give you an example. Like if we're writing about um, campaign planning, which is something like we, um, we have like a very strong use case in Airtable to do like very connected campaign planning across all of your all of your teams. Um, if we're writing about that, we're also saying, okay, like we know what we kind of want to say to our audience. What are they actually looking for? 
So we're going and we're doing our own keyword research and coming up with like, okay, these are the things that we need to like write to because we know this is where like the demand kind of is. Um, so in that case, like we're going to the SEO team and saying like, hey, we've got these topics. Hey, we've got this audience. Like, what are we aiming for? Like, help us like fine tune this strategy here. But then conversely, um, the SEO team might be coming to us and saying, hey, we see a big opportunity with like mm. this set, this like keyword family or whatever it is. Like, what can we write to that? Or like what already exists? Um, we do a lot of optimization. Like the O in SEO is like very important to our strategy because like you can only create like so much new content and you only should create so much new content. A lot of what we do is like come back to the drawing board and like make sure. We've adjusted for the algorithm or um, for our strategy, whatever it is. This is looking back at the the content library and basically saying like, oh, this page dropped in rankings or this page dropped in traffic or click through. How can we proactively update that to make sure that it's still performing? Yeah. And the editorial folks on my team, like they're in our tools like every week saying, how are these numbers going up and down? Like, do we need to do something here? Nice. So I'm assuming that SEO and, and content are both in the marketing org. So is it just like separated by like like demand or growth versus brand? Or like is there like what's the distinction between like how, how those two teams sit? Yeah. So our SEO team sits on what is essentially a growth team. We call it um acquisition and life cycle. Um hmm. and the content team actually sits under like it is product marketing. Um we probably need to like rebrand it, but um, it's product marketing, community, um, field marketing, competitive, and content. I got all five. So we all sit on a team together. Wow. That's pretty similar to how it was when I was at HubSpot. What is field marketing? Um, like uh, pipeline driving events. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. certain terms where I'm like, I don't actually know exactly what that yeah, means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's a funny one. It's like, it's especially funny. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, please don't ask me that question on the record. Um, uh, yeah, so like you know things like we do a, a user conference or like if we appear at a trade show, that kind of stuff. All field marketing. Gotcha. Um, okay, so all of this is related to the question that Ronnie suggested that I ask you, which also because you're at circle. Airtable, Airtable is such a content ops. Like we we use it at the agency. I'm a huge fan of Airtable. I've used it. I used to run experimentation programs. I used Airtable for experimentation Yay! programs. All of this That's stuff. Rad. So Ronnie says, definitely talk to her about running a well-oiled content production process that churned out high quality mm. or quality, as she would joke, content. Yeah. Like we always quality. hit deadlines, but it was never <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. but quality was um, never sacrificed. So first off, explain the joke and uh second off the That's process. Such a- that's such a throwback. I love that. Um, I don't know how many years it's been, but at some point, um, I um, and, and I think Ronnie probably helped me with this presentation. Had to like present to our C suite about quality, um, and I thought it would be like very funny to start with like a huge typo on my slide. So like mm. my first slide said quality. Oh, that's um, funny. I didn't even see the typo. I said I said quality. It, it does say quality. Yeah, see the, yeah, that's that's the amazing thing about the human brain. You know, like fix it. Um, uh, but yeah. So I like got up in front of everyone and I put my big like quality slide up and I was like quality and I could see like on some people's faces and then I like hit the the button and like a beautiful quail like emerged on the screen and I was <laughs> like that's the kind of thing we don't want. I don't know that I would do that today, but um. At the time, I was like very, um, very amused by myself. Um, sorry, what was the question? How do you run a well-oiled content production process mm. that turns out quality content, quality content? Quality content. Um, yeah, keep it light. We should start with that. Um, I mean, this is my this is my whole job. Like, this question is like, what is your job? Um, uh, I mean, gosh, where do I even start? Like, there is. The, let's start with the quality piece. Um, we've already talked about this a, a, a little bit, like with our, like, is it subjective? Is it objective? Um, and as you can tell, like my goal, and I think the goal of like any well-run content team is to like <sighs> make it as least, uh, subjective as possible, like figure out what the rules of the secret sauce are as much as you can and like document those, um, a common pitfall of, um, trying to like produce a lot of really good content 
is that um, you don't know what really good means at your company. Mm. So you are relying on one person or even like a small handful of people to just like gatekeep it all. Right. So you're like, it's, we're not even going to try to define it. We're just going to say if Ronnie's read it and he says it's good, that means it's good. Um, and like that sets off lots of alarm bells for us. Right. Cause like that's not uh, sustainable. What if um, Ronnie like has a baby? Um, what if Ronnie gets a new job? <laughs> um, then what do we do? What happens to our content? And like you see this happen at companies, right? That like they're very reliant on one person, especially if that person has like a very strong voice. Um, and then they don't know what to do after that person leaves. And it kind of like there's like a pale imitation going on. But the problem starts before they leave because even while they're there, that person is slammed. That person like isn't able to like do anything else. Um, and often like there is internal disagreement about what good is that just doesn't get addressed because we're just like, eh, we're just like, we're going to put that question aside and just like let everything filter instead. So like when it comes to every content person has had this moment, I'm sure you have, um, your CEO slacks you and is like, what's up with this tweet? <laughs> like, I don't like yeah. this. Why is this out there? And you're like, oh, I thought it was funny. Like the quail thing. I thought it was great. Um, and like maybe your CEO doesn't have that sense of humor, right? If you have guidelines, if you've taken the time to quantify and align, you now have something to point to. Like you're like, hey, uh, you know, Miss CEO, like remember when we talked about how we want to take risks with our voice on social and that we think like these examples from HubSpot are very funny and we want to do things like that. That's what we're doing here. So um, now we can have a conversation that's like, Oh, that actually felt like it was pushing it too far. So now we have an example of that's too far. And now we're going to document that and not do it again. Or we have a like, oh yeah, you're right. HubSpot does that. We like HubSpot. We want to be like them. Like that's a really different conversation than I thought it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> right. So like that, like, um, and that didn't come to me naturally, like super early in my career, but like that, like now my mind is just like document, programmatize, make it possible to scale. Um, my old boss, Micah, who um, Ronnie also worked under at Eventbrite, would just say, like, what if you got hit by a bus? Like, what would we do? And like, that's in my mind always. What is the artifact that you produce for that? Like, how do you, is this like a style guide? Yeah, yeah. Is this like, a, uh, I love this idea of like actually pointing to a document and saying, like, this is what quality looks yeah, like, yeah. at least on the input side before performance even yeah, counts. Yeah. And who's yeah, involved in creating bunch that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I love I love this stuff. This is where my like operational um I just get very excited. Um, it can be a lot of different things and it's been different things for me at different companies. Um, if I had to pick like what are the like must have assets to make this happen, it would be um your style guide, right? So that's just your like long ass document that's like here's all the things that we believe in and like this is what our voice sounds like, and um here are examples of how we use it, right? Um, guidance for writers on quality. <laughs> so that's where I get like really perked up. Um, but that's where we start to talk about, okay, um, here are like, here's what we think is good from a mechanics perspective. Um, here's what we think is good from um, a point of view perspective. Like, I don't know, most companies I work with, they say, you know, for it to be good, it needs to have a strong perspective, right? Um, most companies are like, I want us to say something new when we, when we talk. Um, I want to um, I want to adhere to our brand voice. Um, like those are kind of the things, right? That most companies want and like make part of their quality definition. So like what I've tended to do, because especially if you're working with um, freelancers or like you have a bunch of different writers who maybe are not like immersed in your day to day, is like make it really simple, like checklists. Like think like a content mar <laughs> marketer here. Like how do I make this something that like a person can just have and kind of go through. Um, so like checklists for different formats, like here are the different areas of quality and like, here's how you know you've checked them off. Um, as an editor, anytime I notice that I've been giving the same feedback over and over, I'm like, is that on the checklist? That should mm -hmm. be on the checklist. Um, <laughs> so like anyone who I've edited would tell you like, I'm obsessed with first sentences. Like I'm like, I'm always like, is this hooky enough? Like, is this short? Like, is this going to like, get them to keep reading? Like, is this saying something really like different and interesting? Like first sentence, first sentence, first sentence. So like that's on my checklist is like hot start. 
Um, and like credit to uh, Jalei Bicharet, who was the one who always said hot start to me at Eventbrite, but like hmm. hot start, that's like on our checklist, right? Um, so like anything like that, um, big one in content marketing is like, oh, have we been saying like we a lot? You know, like when I read a paragraph, it's just like, when we set out to like make our amazing product, we never really, and you're like, da, 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 da. no one cares, no one cares. Um, like this should be like reader focused. Like I should read it and say like, it should be saying, when you have this problem, <laughs> you know, like, like here's how you can solve it. Not we realize that we can solve problems, right? Like very different. Um, so like something on my checklist is like, have you interrogated like every use of the word we? Did we need every we in this? Right. Um, so anyway, so we've got like brand voice, um, style guide, checklist for like writers and reviewers. Um, and then a fourth one that I really love that we're just starting to do at Airtable is like regular workshopping of published content. So it takes the heat off a little. We're just going to look at three of the most recent things that we like shipped that are like out there in the world. And we're going to like group review them, right? And say like, okay, did this feel like it embodied our brand characteristics? What do we think of this first paragraph? Um, is the CTA really strong here? Um, is there another piece that we could link to? Let's just like comfortably <laughs> as a group, like ask these questions. And that's going to make this feel like we're doing this by committee. There's no one person in the hot seat. It's already out there. It's fine. Um, but also like next time we all sit down to write or review something, we're thinking about these conversations. I, I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> another thing I noted is like the specificity. And this harkens back to the first thing we talked about, which is like the subjectivity involved and like taste and all that stuff. Yeah. But it, yeah. when you were talking, it really made me think about when I was at CXL and it was a very, very small company, small marketing team. It was initially just me and then uh, Chanel joined. So it was just two of us. So we would uh -huh. leverage a lot of guest writers and freelancers and, and on and on. And CXL, this is like common now, but at the time, like it was one of the few that did like really long form, like technical, like super in-depth content research backed and all that stuff. So it was like very high standards. Um, and I remember we had a vision. The editorial vision was basically like, <laughs> this content has to be the best piece ever published in the world on this topic, which is like impossible. I love that. But yeah. I love that. That's it's, so great. That's so to inspiring as a writer. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you, you know, That's if you're awesome. honest and self-aware, like if you're in that direction yeah. or if you're not, but like, you can't just say that, right? Like, cause best is subjective. So like, there's all these different things that like we included to get there. And I think one of them was like, it, this was like the voice of CXL, but like, it was like opinions are bullshit, do the research or cite the research. Mm -hmm. So instead of just mm -hmm. saying something, you had to back it up. And then when I was editing, I could say like, cite this source, cite this source, you know? And like, yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. Just something like generic or like cut the fluff. Like a lot of the time, like mm -hmm. people will write like seven paragraphs in the introduction and then they're like, let's jump into it. And it's like, Cut that. Yeah. Go to that's the point, such a you know? crazy. But it was very yeah. specific stuff that we could that's use. Such a, that's such a good editing hack. What yeah. is that? Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, like, that's such a good editing hack, by the way. It's just like strike the first paragraph. Cut the intro. Probably yeah. Better now. yeah. Yeah. Cut Tommy the Walker. Oh my gosh. Who, wow. Who was at, uh, well, you know Tommy Walker. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Tommy. Yeah. 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 So he was a CXL before, before I was. And he always called that like clearing your throat. It's like, yes. As Absolutely. you write the first couple paragraphs, you're, you're really just like, getting the gunk out of the you're system. Just, and you're just, getting started. You're thinking. Yeah. You're thinking out loud. So yeah. most of the time you cut that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what's funny is I do actually find that sometimes people spend so much time on their introduction, probably for that reason, right? That they're like, oh, but like, what is it? Like, I really need to set the scene here. And then it ends up like also very like belabored. Like when you read it, you're like, whoa, like everything else has a nice flow, but like, this is like really stop and starty because it clearly like did take you so much time. Like I can feel the time that you spent writing it. Yeah. yeah cut it out, get rid of it. Yeah. Do you ever worry about like overburdening or over engineering process? It, it doesn't sound like your operations are like that, but that's something that I think about often is like, it, it might make it maybe easier for me on the management level, but like, I don't want to yeah. sort of make it like very rote and like take every piece of autonomy out of the process for the, the writer or, or whoever's kind of like using the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can be done. Um, there have been times where um, when we start getting like very modular with our content, this actually hasn't happened to me at Airtable, but at some other companies where we were really trying to say like, okay, every piece 
has an introduction that's this long. And then we have um, a paragraph setting the problem. And then we have five bullet points about how to solve it. Like, I think when you, I think going down that road can end up feeling, um, it just ends up like reading less organically, right? Mm -hmm. Because like your writer never gets into like a flow state. Um, Because I do think like, I'm sure you've had this experience. Like sometimes the words just pour out. And don't mm-hmm. you find that when the words just pour out, it reads that way too? Yeah. Um, like you can actually... <laughs> so like if you keep... Yeah, it just... It, it actually like... It comes across, right? Like as a reader, you're like, wow, this is just flowing. And that's because you're like... You're just... You're now in someone's brain following their beautiful thought process rather than like feeling them try to communicate a thought. Um, those are very different experiences. And like I'd argue like academic stuff often is like all the latter. Right. Yeah. And that's fine because they're like, I have this big idea. Oh, I have to get it across. And these the biggest words and the longest sentences. Um, and sometimes it's super rewarding to like read Foucault or whatever. And that's fine. But like, generally, not what we're trying to go for in our content. Um, so, yes, to answer your question, I think you can over engineer. Um, you'll read it, <laughs> you'll read the over engineering in, in the final product. Um, but I think it's hard to do. Like, Especially because I tend to hire people who are like super creative um, and like kind of index more on the like needing a little more structure. Um, I don't encounter that quite as much in my field. Mm. That's interesting. I mean, personally, I've never experienced it because I think I've not put myself in the position as a writer to be adherent to a lot of like overly rigid processes, but like I've so I've seen the content brief is, is where I see this done pretty frequently because the content brief is important. Obviously you want to set Mm -hmm. expectations, guardrails. This piece has a goal you want it to accomplish that, but I've seen some content briefs. Actually, I was going to write a guest post for a company and I saw a content brief and it was like three pages long. I'm like, I don't know if my article is going to be three pages long. Like what, what do you want me to write? Probably not. This piece is 75% (laughs) written. (laughs) So it just gave me zero wiggle room. And I'm like, I'm not going to, this is not, no. But I see well, a lot of people do that over- now. They way over engineer the brief where it's like you did all yeah. the research, you put all the bullet points, and now just use an AI tool. Like you've got the piece basically done. Yeah. 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 Well, I wouldn't consider that over engineered. I'd consider that just like overdeveloped, right? Because yeah. like I think of over engineered as like too many requirements. Whereas like wait, I think what you're talking about, I have a writer um on my team um who writes outlines that are like basically done. Mm -hmm. Like her outline is a first draft and that's fine. That's how her brain works. Amazing. Wonderful. But like, it's not a outline. (laughs) Um, And like, again, like honestly, it it means that she moves, she's able to like move very quickly because she can like get into that space so fast. Um, But like, I wouldn't hand that off to your point. I wouldn't hand that off to a writer at that point because there's not that much to do. Yeah. It's so funny how our different brains work. Like I don't outline basically at all. And others write the uh-huh. entire article in the outline, basically. Yeah, I like vi- I I don't do a ton of writing anymore. Um, like for for work, I still do. A, I do a lot of writing on my own, but like um, I do find when I have to write something for work, like a long form something, that I have a shape in my mind, and it really is a shape. You know, yeah. like I can kind of see it, how long the paragraphs are, and kind of where they are. But I very rarely take the time to like write out the outline from there. I'm usually just like, I know my shape. I'm just going to like do that. Um, <laughs> I once had, um, unbeknownst to me, I had like a, I was, I was turning an interview into a, a blog post and um, I didn't realize that someone else was in the doc, like, you know, like spying on me over, over the like, over Google Docs, basically. So she watched me like rearrange stuff for like an hour and a half. And then I was like, okay, great. I'm done. And then she, I like hear this. It was um, uh, my friend Keiko who worked with me. <laughs> right? She was just like, I just watched you do that. That was like amazing. Like what was like, cause she's, she, she's actually a great writer, but she wouldn't call herself one. She was just like, that was so like cool to like watch you put that together. Um, and I was like, Oh, I'm just like, this is just, this is what we do. You know, we're just like, you see the pieces and you're just like rearranging them until they look right. Mm. And sometimes you just know when they look right. Right. Um, 
But also that's when you get your editor to come in and tell you all the ways that it doesn't actually work right. So Right, right. And there, yeah, there's different purposes and, and use cases for each of those different like mind frames that you approach a piece. But I love that visual yeah. aspect. That's something that I've tried to explain to people. This is kind of going down a, a weirder rabbit hole, but we were talking at a party Great. about like synesthesia. Synth- synth- like where you like uh-huh. your colors and stuff you can like, like see tastes and stuff. Yeah, 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 totally. So kind of yeah. related to that matter, we were talking about there's there's a certain subset of people who don't have like an inner uh, monologue, like they don't hear a voice in their head. Do you hear a voice? Oh in your head? yeah, yeah. You know, if I've been reading, I do. Um, kind of back to like that thing we were talking about with um, Ronnie and the business books, but like if I've been reading someone, especially someone good. Um, it gets in my head and I find that that person is like narrating my day. Um, but when you're like walking around just like, randomly, do you ever have like a conversation yeah. with your health self in your head? Like, Oh, like I, sh- I got to take out the trash or like, Oh, you should have said that. Like, Oh, why'd you say this? You know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, like I have a small child. So like I say a lot of things out loud that I didn't used to, <laughs> um, for, for, for two reasons. Like one, my memory is shot. I like haven't slept in three years. So like, just to like keep reminding myself what we're doing, I will be like, okay, like now it's time to like put the laundry in. Um, But also like, it's good for kids to just like nonstop talk to them. So I also am just like saying and name things to him all day. Um, So yeah, I guess I do. But, but no, I don't have that. Like, I don't have that like internal narrator. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to pull the whole conversation to, down that rabbit hole, but it, it I talk to me. other people in my head. Do you do that? I will be like, I'll be in like full conversation with someone. Yeah. In my so head. you have that. Yeah. You have that voice then. Okay. Yeah. So that makes more sense. Yeah. yeah I, I definitely have full. But it's just me. Head. It's me just like, yeah, I'm like arguing with someone and then I'm like, I'm like legit getting mad at them, yes, you know? I'll and then I'm like, the oh, they, they didn't, they didn't, like they don't even know that. about this argument. That was all me. But yeah, it's just like yeah. my poor like partner is just like sitting there on the couch and I'm just like, like what? <laughs> it's like what and i'm like oh right you you don't actually think any of the things that you just like said to me in your in my head that's so, so funny yeah yeah so you got that Good stuff. but yeah we were talking about how mm-hmm. the in in absence of that or in supplement to that like i play music and oftentimes like when i would write or listen to music like i would i would see it or feel it in terms of like colors and shapes and oh, jujitsu uh-huh. as well jujitsu was never something like that i would think through logically or syntactically it was like something that i would see different like visual shapes yeah so there's certain areas yeah. of the brain that yeah. maybe activate during that writing process as well where it's like a very visual thing instead of like a linear logical that... type thing okay so like let's talk about steph curry because i'm in san francisco um and steph curry is like such an amazing local treasure right um, I watched his master class on, um, oh, are you a basketball good. person? Am I, am I, am I like boring you? Um, no, 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 a little bit. Like uh, I'm not like super okay. into it, but um, a little bit boring. Yeah. yeah. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So like the thing with Steph Curry, right. Is like his three point shots, right. He's like, he changed the game. Mm-hmm. Um, he is, he is, the, he is the best shooter of all time. Like by any statistical perspective, he is the best shooter that has ever lived, which is like crazy that we get to like see this man. Um, but like the way he talks about his shot, it's like, clearly it's similar to what you're saying with the jujitsu. Like, he's not like, okay, set it up. Be the best. Like he gets in flow, he gets in flow and that's how he makes it happen. But also he works so hard on the mechanics of his shot. And at one point he, I think he was like in high school, he talks about how he had to like completely change the mechanics of his shot. Mm. Um, because he grew, <laughs> right? Like that he like he was suddenly a different height. Um, and like the way he had been shooting did not make sense anymore. Like his body composition had changed as he became an adult. So now like he had to, and he already had this incredible shot, but he had to completely reconfigure it. So he had to go from like, okay, I have this way of doing this, I have my flow state, I'm able to like just like be in rhythm with this, um, to like, oh, I have to completely break down every piece of the way I do this and like identify the specific elements, change them, relearn them, get back into flow state. And I think like, that's how I think about writing is like, you do get into these flow states with it. And that's how you get beautiful basketball. And that's how you get beautiful writing. But you also sometimes like really frequently have to start like breaking it down and like remaking it. To me, that's what reading can often do. And that's also what, what I think. And I hope like working with like 
an invested editor can do for you too. Yeah, I think you reach Breakdown. a certain ceiling like with with like so again, back to music, like playing guitar, I didn't really take formal lessons. So I think I probably capped myself in terms of like how technically proficient I can actually get. <clears throat> and I'm sure. not motivated enough to go back and like relearn like the proper technique. But um, I started yeah. college as a music major and I played percussion. And mm -hmm. uh, like all of my life, like, again, never had like professional training. Like I just kind of like hit drums and I was just a spastic kid. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just too much energy, you know? And I got to, yeah, yeah. to college in uh, uh, the first semester as a music major, like I had to um, audition and then go through and like, I went through all this like professional training and I had to completely redo like how I held drumsticks. And I remember yeah, just feeling exactly. like, I, I felt like a five-year-old. Like I was like, I don't know, I can barely play like, like one-on-one level rudimentary stuff. Like, right. but once, right. once you acclimate right. to that new style or that new technique, it completely it, al it allows like your your ceiling to grow much higher basically but the the process is yeah, so yeah. uncomfortable yeah 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 exactly exactly yeah it's really painful and it's really important um yeah and i think like ideally i, I mean it, like we can make like the muscle analogy right like you have to break down your existing muscles to make room like to like build new muscles right like that's why yeah. when you're strength training you push yourself beyond what is comfortable so you're actually like literally breaking them down Right. And that's how you grow. Like if you're going to grow in anything, we're talking about writing or, or music, like you have to go through that process and you have to be open to going through that process, like over and over and over and over and over again to keep growing. That was deep. <laughs> we're getting so deep. We're, it's, it's the, it's the, um, it's the walking desk. That's, that's what, what is bringing you to these steps. It's the Do motion. You wanna... Yes. Do you want to talk about why you think content marketing is dead? And I think he said cheesy too. Yes. So if you just want to like really offend everybody yes. in content. Yes. Yeah. And I just won't <laughs> explain it. I'm just going to say content marketing is cheesy. Content marketing is dead. Drop my mic. Let's move on. <laughs> um, no, I'd love to talk about it. Like, okay. So when I started out in content, I worked at Marketo and I learned from like some really talented content marketers. But like, you probably remember this. The thing of that moment was, oh my gosh, you guys, what if we stopped hitting people over the head with the thing we want them to buy, right? And then like, we stopped saying like, buy one, get one free. That's content. We're done. And we started saying, let me offer you something of value, right? In exchange for your like loyalty and love, right? Like we're going to give you something for free. Like I worked at Mercado, so it'd be like, we're going to give you a bunch of best practices for like writing performance marketing ads or um, for like testing your email nurtures for free. I give this to you. Um, of course, I'm going to subtly plug my products, but like, you know, that's happening. You know, whose blog you're on. Um, and like in exchange for that, you're going to like love us and like think of us as a leader and like refer to us when you need something. And it's kind of this like long game for building like, both like customer acquisition and nurture, but also like retention, right? Um, and that was kind of like a revelation. Do you remember this? And everyone was like, oh my God, value. Um, mm -hmm. I remember everyone would always be like, those um, like Lowe's had this series that was like helping you do stuff around the house, which makes lots of sense for them because they'd also be like, and use our nails or whatever. But like mm -hmm. people love that, like helpful, helpful content coming from a brand. Now, I would argue in the like decades since then <laughs> we're now like like your audience is super suspicious of that a because we've been like 10 years of like hey like just talking about nails but like buy our nails right <laughs> like there's something always like a little bit disingenuous there and like your audience is like kind of tired of that right um and the other piece of that is like there's so much shitty SEO content out there that like if you're actually trying to like figure out how to do something and you google it you're just in a sea of yeah. garbage right the worst. so like we've <laughs> it's so bad it's so bad um my partner is always like the internet is broken and he is right um and that's why people are like more into like chat gtp right now to answer questions than google right because like chat gtp actually gives you everything whereas like google is like no we're like we're this is just based on who's paying the most for our ads so like Anyway, so we're very suspicious of like 
the internet as a place to like teach us how to do basic things quickly. So we don't want... If I'm like, okay, I'm like working on... I'll go back to my marketing campaigns example. Um, like if I'm just trying to figure out how to do something, like I'm like, how should I approach this? You know, like I have to figure out my campaigns for the year. Who do I need to bring into the conversation? Um, like what order should I do this in? What's like a reasonable timeline? Like just like give me some frameworks, maybe, because like I want to make sure I'm doing this in a smart way. If I start Googling that, I'm gonna get like what is campaign planning? Oh, there yes. are 20 yeah, yeah. types of con- of campaign plans ranging from the benefits of rudimentary to sophisticated and the benefits of and the tools that you should use. And it's just like, I'm just really tr- like, I actually want to know something right now. Yeah. So like my trust in this mechanism that like that kind of content marketing is so reliant on is low, is really, really low. So like, so when I say it's dead, I mean like, that kind of content marketing that like content is king because like you're gonna be the way people have you know are like learning things like we're gonna like educate and drive value um just from all our great best practices like that stuff is out like mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think people are happy with what they're getting there. What you can do like where I've kind of arrived um like thinking about this at Airtable has been like okay just like actually, what do they want to know? Like, forget the search terms for a second. Like, forget the volume opportunity. Like, what are they actually trying to figure out? And if I sincerely believe that Airtable is a good solution for doing that thing, campaign planning, I think Airtable is really, really good for campaign planning. Just tell them that. Like, we Mm -hmm. don't have... like, Like, there is actually a space between, like, hitting people over the head and being like... Like, I would never have my team write something that's like, the only way to plan your campaign is with Airtable. If you don't mm-hmm. use Airtable to plan your campaign, like you may as well just like quit your job because like yeah. you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to do this. Yeah. Because um, that's not true. That's not true. Um, but what is true is like there are like we do actually have opinions about like how to plan a campaign. You know, we have opinions because we built our products, like pieces of our product around those opinions that we can then share with you. And also, yeah, again, we built our product around this, so like that would be great product <laughs> to do it. And whether you're going to or not, we can use the product to like show you what we mean. And it's going to make that concept like a lot easier for you to grasp. Like that to me is like the answer to this like weird, crowded, overstuffed with words um, solution space. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I've I've not agreed more strongly with a take on this podcast before this one. This hmm. this is like you hit so many of my common rants <laughs> in just the, like, one take there. Cause you, you came from Marketo and I came from HubSpot and I think yeah, yeah. You, it's, it's like the approach works. It worked like they built up engines that way. But yeah, yes. like if you're yes. a consumer, like oftentimes for me, like I search my search term and then I, I put like put Reddit or something like that. Cause I, I know that right. I'm just going to get totally. bullshit content. And I remember yes. one specific example, like I was looking to do, I don't know. I was trying to look like how to create a welcome email or like a welcome email sequence or something like that. And same thing happened. It was like, what is a welcome email? The benefits. Yeah, you're like, no. Like, just tell me how to do this like basic thing. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing you hit on was like product intertwining and like how it's like there's this this fear of being salesy or like in any way invoking the actual product that your business sells and pays you to sell via content marketing. Right. And, and by the like, way, like, and which it says at the top of your, it says article, it at the top of the website, you know, you know like, you're biased, like they, know. they know you're biased, yeah. <laughs> they know, <laughs> like, it's so right, obvious. Right. And it's yeah. also, it's, it's pulling away potential value from the reader by not, yeah. by not explaining that this could potentially be a solution. And like you yeah. said, it's, it's like, it, it's almost more skepticism inducing to be like yeah. o- overly friendly marketer. It's like, it's, yeah. just, it's like when somebody's, you're walking down the street, somebody's way too friendly to you for no reason that you've never met before. Yeah. You're like, what do yeah. you want? Like, like, what, you, yeah, what? like I'm my red flags are raised right now. Right. Well, and like, don't you find I love everything you just said. And like, don't you find that like it also reads weird? You know, like, it does, which, like yeah. Like that 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 hesitation, that like beating around the bush translates into like very strange copy. Like yeah. you end up you end up with stuff that's like it's quite insecure. If copy. you if you might be interested, perhaps <laughs> in some kind of Oh, I don't know. 
you know, platform or something. Like, it's just like so weird. And like, <laughs> get, like, email, like cold email pitches yeah. like that. It's just like, tell me what oh, you're yeah. asking for. I'm not going to read oh, the 10 paragraphs. Just what do you want? Like, I'll say can yes we, or no. Can we talk about like the state of cold outbound right now? It is so wild out there. I screenshot them all the time. Cause I'm just like, what's going on with these poor BDRs? Like, why are they sending me these crazy emails? <laughs> Um, are you I've talking been about getting, like the like, really cheesy ones with like gifts well, and like, like videos and like crazy like the passive aggressive ones? Like the like Margaret, I have been reaching out to you for seven times, and you um, have not responded to any of my emails, and I'm extremely concerned about the state of your um, oh, digital yeah, asset management yeah. platform, and I really need you to tell me the right person to contact. Um, I will call you in 15 minutes. I somehow have your phone number. You know, it's just like, it just feels like so unhinged. And you're like, yeah. okay, like, I like this is written as if we have some kind of relationship, as if I had like asked you for something. Like, that's very, the tone is very much like, why are you ghosting me, Margaret? Yeah. And I'm like, I've never heard of you. And, and I actually still don't understand what your product is. So, like, can we please stop? Um, yeah. Those, yeah, they're, they're, they're getting, they're getting really. Um, you always feel the end of the quarter. I just like it like control. it's like the the, the many follow ups is is obviously super annoying, but I don't like it when it's like I can't tell what they're actually going for. When it's like, do you, yeah. like when they say like something vaguer on like partner, I'm like, does that mean oh, you want to yeah. sell me something, or you want to yeah. work with my agency, yeah. or you want to write well, a guest post, or like what do you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes lately they've been like, I would just love to talk about your content strategy. Yeah, I'm like, no, nah. and like. Yeah, well, and it's like, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, a friend of a friend or something, you know, it could okay, be yeah, actually, yeah. you know, it could be someone who like, like, I actually do like to talk about content strategy if someone wants to talk about content strategy. But it's like, it's like, it's somebody who has like some kind of content tool, and they just want to like, they want to pitch, but they frame it as like, yeah, I've had let's, those, yeah. let's you and I just talk content strategy. And I'm like, this is very like, so I just say no across the board. So like most, like I'm probably missing like actual. I don't people. think like I think it's people who are incentivized <laughs> by uh, meetings booked or something like that, or it's a founder who mm-hmm. doesn't know what they're doing mm-hmm. necessarily. Because mm-hmm. for me, like I don't want to waste my time and and trick somebody onto a, what I think is a sales yeah, call yeah. that they don't think is a sales call. So like I've done a couple yeah. cold emails and I just I'm I'm like I'm, I want to work with your company. Like I want, I, I run right, an agency, just, you know what I mean? Like, cause then like if they say yes, I know it's actually a good fit versus like trying to trick yeah. them on. And then, you know, obviously like I waste my time, I waste their time. It's it. You're just kicking the can down the road. If you're being like uh super vague and obfuscating what you're actually asking for. Well, and like, I mean, you head on it with like time, right? Like I think that, I mean, time is like our most valuable asset right now. Like more than anything, anything, anything right now. I'm like, I mean, and this is maybe partially like as a, a parent of a young child. Um, um, again, like I'm a person. Like I have a, I have a, I have a big job that's really important to me, and I want to do really well. Um, and I also have like a whole life that is important to me that I want to do well. So like asking for my time is like, it's a pretty big deal. Like I don't ask people for their time lightly either. Um, and there is something about these, like, <laughs> you can tell I get like heated when I read them, but like something about this, like method of outreach that just feels like, so, um, uh, like dumb on that point that like, yeah. that's how everybody kind of is. So like, if you're asking someone for their time, there has to like really be. It's weird. It's like an entitlement to your time yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's how, that's how it can really feel. Um, and I, Yeah. Talk to I've talked to folks at places I work about that one too. Like, hey, this feels feels real passive aggressive. This oh, feels yeah, real entitled. That. Let's work I feel on like that. that's like yeah. a, a boundary that I try to set that triggers me when people try to like pass it. It's like when people just add time to my calendar with no agenda or like not asking me. Oh, I'm like, yeah. That was just because that was free doesn't mean I yeah. wasn't doing something. Like that's you still <laughs> just took my time. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel I feel so bad for folks and like big leadership positions who are just like you know have everyone like wants a piece of them and they just like can't find any time but um yeah but i do like you know i something something i try to do that i'm like coaching my team to do too is like decline meeting invites um and like trying mm-hmm. to be a jerk about it like i'm not like if there's no agenda i'm declining even though i'd love to be that person that's not who i am but i will like slack that person and say like hey like 
what is it that you want to talk about? <laughs> I think that's an important thing is you, you don't want to infer yeah. like malintent on the other person. Like yeah. that might just be yeah. the way they've Assume. been trained to do things. So yeah. it's like, just say, Hey, what's, what's the purpose of this meeting? Should I like prepare anything? Yeah. And Hey, in the future, yeah. I would love if you, you know, ping me before you add the time, like that's yeah. usually my deep work time and I can shift things around if you need to meet or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, um, this is hard for, um, us busy bodies, but like, sometimes you look at who else is in the meeting and you're like, if that person's there, I don't need to be there. Mm. So I am not going to be there and I will communicate. Hey, Caitlin's going to be there. She'll let me know if there's anything I missed. I will not be there. Bye. Um, and cause often I find like, especially at like a growing company, people just add, they add people to meeting invites because they're like, oh, I don't want that person to yeah. feel like they weren't included. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the not the problem. Yeah, please exclude me. Please <laughs> exclude me. Yes. How do you set boundaries as a content team, especially at a scaling company? I, I feel like content teams are often looked at as, <clears throat> I don't know, the center of excellence isn't the right word, but it's like a resource that multiple teams can kind of like ping and like, you know, you're almost yeah. operating on a ticket system of sorts. Like sometimes like people are like, Oh, I need copy yeah. here and I need content for this. And and then yeah. you find that your team actually has no time to work on the initiatives and the strategy that you set out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're really lucky at Airtable in a couple ways there. Cause I've definitely been in exactly the situation you describe. And early days at Airtable felt like that often. Um, like it would just be like, does anyone like know how to write? Cause like, could you look at this if you know how to write? And I'm like, well, I actually have something. I'm Okay. Um, but in the early days, you kind of like pitch in more in that way. Today, we have like copywriters, <laughs> which is like so awesome. Um, really talented copywriters on the creative team. So like, because it's, it's really different. It's a really different type of workflow, totally. right? To like say, hey, I need a hundred different headlines is really different than like, I need a report based on this data that we can like send to customers. So like, you know, if I've got someone working on that report and they have to come away and like spitball on like subheader ideas for an hour, that's very distracting. You know, like that's not like, and that might not be their skill set, frankly. Um, versus now we have these copywriters who can really like take on that big, very specific lane of work that like frankly requires a whole different type of experience than a lot of content people have. Um, so that's in one piece. Second piece is like, we don't do tickets. Like I'm like anti-ticket. <laughs> um, we're not an operations team. Mm -hmm. um, we're not like we're not setting up dashboards. Like we don't work in sprints. Like that's not that's not how we plan our work. Um, and I've really done that by like I shouldn't say I, but like Airtable has really done that by like really connecting up content with both campaigns and product marketing. So like we plan our work with our lifecycle team. So like. We plan down to the blog post what we are going to do for the half as part of that planning like session. So like there's wiggle room. We probably have planned 80% of our quarter, you know, and then there's that 20% to like play around with. But like I really try to look at resourcing across my team on the like long time horizon and make it really clear that like if you want something, that's kind of not enough, right? Like if one person at Airtable wants a particular piece of content, unless it's Howie, that's probably not enough. Like it needs to be like this has this like idea, this theme has been like aligned on across leadership. And we've looked at it against other things we can do and we've prioritized it. And that's why we're doing it, not because it was requested. Right. Um, and like that shift took how long have I been in Airtable? <laughs> Three years. Um, I think like after the first six months, we started making that shift as the team grew, just to like accommodate the way we wanted to plan across the team. And I would say again, we're probably like 80% there now. Mm. Do you have any other strange productivity hacks other than uh walking in a treadmill desk during <laughs> podcasts? <laughs> yes, walk on treadmill desk. Um, honestly, though, like for reviewing and like reading things. Always I am walking because like it just like lights up my brain in a specific way. So like anyone who like has a lot of reviewing to do, I really recommend it. Um other productivity things. You know, I like the usual. I like don't look at Slack. Again, if you're walking, you really can't multitask. You really can only do one thing. So like that like clears up a lot for me. Um and I also like I walk outside during a lot of one-on-ones. So like do a lot of like phone call one-on-ones. 
Um, just because like, remember when we used to get coffee with our colleagues? It's like kind of that same vibe. It just like opens up more. Um, I plan my calendar out to the minute. I'm sure a lot of people do this, but like at the beginning of every week, I'm like looking at the next week and being like, do I have an hour? I need an hour every single day. That's just like not evening time, not like after my kid goes to sleep and I'm like frantically doing stuff, but like during the work day while my brain is in that space, like have I carved out time to, <laughs> to like actually do some of my work? Um, and yeah, and then just like really, um, what's the word? Ruthless meeting cancellations. Mm, that's you a know? good one. Yeah, don't go to meetings. <laughs> uh, do you think there's anything else that I didn't ask you that you want to explore in the last? No, I mean, no, we talked about Steph Curry. <laughs> that was all I really needed. We got in Steph Curry. Yeah, that yeah. was a good tangent. I do want to, I do want to like quickly say though, like Steph Curry gets a lot of accolade as he should, greatest shooter of all time, as I mentioned. But um, I think I put this in your like conversation form, but like Kevon Looney, most durable player on the Warriors. Um, he has played, I think, more games than any other Warrior since he started. Um, almost never injured. I think he's had like on injury. Um, and like just puts up like amazing numbers. Um, or rather like does a lot of things that aren't reflected in the numbers. So like big shout out to Kavan. I see you. Um, and like those are the kind of players, like the non-showy players who like get everything done that like we love and that we like want on our teams. <laughs> I'm really glad you chose to end the podcast with that. That was, that was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I know that he listens to your podcast. So um, I just wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that he, Shout out. he, knew, he knew. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, where can people find you online? Uh, nowhere. <laughs> I wanted to ask about that. Um, yeah, God, we, we yeah, got to do a part I'm, two. Because you're not active yeah. on social, really. No, zero, 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 any of that. Um uh yeah I I mean I'm like public on Instagram if you want to like see my kids cool outfits but like that's all, that's all that we do. <laughs> I am cool. not like whatever the opposite of an influencer is. Yeah, is yeah. What so I am. don't don't yeah. find you online. I mean yeah it, it, good luck. Just enjoy the episode. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't this enough? <laughs> um yeah just send me a cold outbound email if you really want to talk. That's that's what I prefer. <laughs> With seven follow-ups. All right. Yes. Yes. Well thank you. Thank you so much. This is super fun. Yeah, this is awesome, Alex. It was really nice meeting you and uh, thanks for letting me walk and chat.